Hello, welcome to Free Bible Commentary with Pastor Teacher Dr. Bob Utley. Be sure to visit Free Bible Commentary at www.freebiblecommentary.org. Now, here's Bob. We're going to be in 1 John chapter 4 today. I think it's an extremely significant passage for this reason. There are so many people who claim to speak for God today. How do you know who speaks for God? Well, 1 John chapter 4, verses 1 through 6 are a particular passage in the Bible that, that tells us. I want to show you a graphic, if I could, of some other places where tests are given. Now, the first test we find is uh, on your screen there. Jesus is fully God and fully man. And that's, of course, the emphasis of 1 John, especially in chapter 1. And then we have in this verse 1 through 6, who listens? Who's the audience? The world or God's people? And then I think in verse 7 is this particular motif throughout 1 John, by their fruits ye shall know them. If they claim that sin doesn't make any difference, if they don't live lives that are loving one another, it's obvious they're not from God. And Matthew 7 is a parallel. And then I think another one is, going back to the Old Testament, these accurate predictions from Deuteronomy 13, 1 through 3. Now, you know, some folks think that if you just uh, make 500 predictions and five come true, that you're a prophet. Well, Deuteronomy 13 says you make 500 predictions, 500 will come true if you're from God. So here's John's continuing emphasis and test between doctrine and moral ethical lifestyle. Now, friends... The content of the message is crucial. And the life of the proclaimer is crucial. And who listens is crucial. Now that basically is an overview of the test. Now remember first John's written to give assurance. He's not trying to um, uh, start a witch hunt. He's trying to affirm the people of God versus the false teachers. Let's look then. Now when we begin chapter 4 verse 1... We need to see it's related to three passages. It's related, if you'll turn back one page, to chapter 3, verse 24, which says that He has given us the Spirit. Well, how do we know the Holy Spirit speaking to us? Have you ever had problems of wondering, is this God speaking to me or Satan speaking to me? You see, Satan comes as an angel of light quoting Scripture in Matthew chapter 4. How do you know it's God and not your own fallen nature or the evil one? Well, here's the criteria. You're going to be able to know how it's the Holy Spirit. Now, the second thing I think, there are two different places in the Bible where it talks about testing spirits. Now, the first one is 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 10. But let me say to you now, that is a spiritual gift. And so, there's going to be only certain ones in the church who have that particular gift to know if someone is from God or Satan and their motivation. But now, John chapter 4 is not related to the spiritual gift found in 1 Corinthians 12, 10. It's related to how any Christian can know. You and I, without that special gift, how can we know? Well, we can tell by content, lifestyle, and audience. And so this is for all believers. Now, another good parallel passage about this testing the spirits is 1 Thessalonians 5, 20 and 21. Now, let me mention to you then, Dearly beloved, stop believing every so-called... Now, my Williams translation has spiritual utterance, but really it's the word spirit. Behind every human speaker is one of two supernatural forces, the Holy Spirit or the evil one. Now, I do believe sometimes men speak out of their own power, but the Bible's presupposition is that behind the physical world is the spiritual world and nothing just happens in the physical world. Now this stop believing is a present imperative with the May article which means stop and act already in process. They were being fooled and they need to watch out. Now, um, our tendency today as well as the people that First John was writing to is to look at those false teachers and say, wow, what a personality. What a strong, logical argument. What a dynamic person. And I want to tell you, if we're not careful, we're going to be tricked by logic and personality. Now, I want you to notice, the other thing here I think is very important, begins in verse 2 where it says, but keep testing them to see whether they come from God. Now, the word for testing here is a word that means to test with a view toward approval. Now, this comes from the, the metallurgist world where ore was placed in a 
crucible and heated and the pure ore was on the bottom and you could scoop the dross off. And that's the idea here. When you hear someone claim to be from God, take them at face value. Give them the benefit of the doubt until you hear what they say and see how they live. Okay? So no witch hunt here. We're trying to affirm. Uh, testing them to see where they come from God because many false prophets have gone out into the world. Now, have gone out is perfect tense. They've gone out in the past. They remain in the world. You know, Jesus talks so often about false prophets. Let me give you a few references. Matthew 7, 15. Matthew 24, 24. These false prophets even do miracles. Many people are fooled by the miraculous, think that miraculous is automatically God. No, it's not. And then notice Acts 20, 28 and 30 and 2 Peter 2, 1. Friends, false prophets always come from within the church. Heresy always comes from within the church. And it always comes in sheep's clothing. It always comes quoting the Bible. It always comes uh, in the name of God. We must remember that. Now, verse 2. In this way, you can recognize the Spirit of God. Now, here's a way we're going to be able to tell. How do we know who's of God? This you can recognize is either present indicative or present imperative. And the form is exactly the same in Greek, so we can't be sure. Now, the Spirit of God. How do we know the Spirit of God? Well, he's going to tell us. Every spirit which owns that Jesus Christ has come in human form comes from God. Friends, the Holy Spirit is going to magnify the person of Christ. Let me tell you again. The Holy Spirit is going to magnify the person of Christ. Look at John 14 through 16. The Spirit's task is to lift up the Son. And so we're going to know that by the fact that he points to Jesus Christ. In 1 Corinthians 12, 3, Paul says the test uh, of how you know it's the Holy Spirit is because it say, it, you can say Jesus is Lord only through the Holy Spirit. Now, there's the test. I want you also to recognize here that when it says anyone which owns... Now, this is the word homologeo. I've got a graphic I'd like to show you on this word. It's usually translated confess. And basically, it's a term uh, that refers to... Um, specific, public, verbal testimony. And look how often it's used in 1 John. It's used over and over and over again. It's used in the Gospel of John, chapter 9, verse 22. It's used in 2 John, verse 7. And so here we have this word over and over. It's used to confess sin in 1, 9, but used to confess the Son and all the others. Now, homo means the same and legeo means speak. So it means to speak the same as, and the idea is public, specific testimony to Christ. Anyone who owns Christ. I believe that all the early church were baptized as their public profession of faith. And I believe, because of Romans chapter 9, they would say, I believe Jesus is Lord, was their affirmation of faith. Um, all right, let's, let's see. I want to mention where it says Jesus Christ has come in human form in verse 2. Now, this is perfect tense, which means he's come in the past, he remains human. The only aspect of the Trinity which has a corporal existence is Jesus Christ. His humanity was not temporary. Once he came as a man, he remains a man. When we see him, we'll see him in bodily form. Now, the other side of this is, this is the central heresy that John is trying to combat. Now, whether it's docetic Gnosticism or another type of Greek philosophy mixed with Judaism or Christianity, we're not sure. But obviously, they're denying the humanity of Jesus Christ. The central truth of the New Testament is that Jesus is fully God and fully man. Some people had a real problem in the early church about his humanity. Now, our day is totally different with God's spell and Jesus Christ Superstar, our day has no problem asserting his humanity, but we have problem with his deity, which is an equally horrendous heresy. Now, by the way, you might want to see John 1, 14, okay? Come in human form. Notice it says, And no spirit which disowns Jesus can come from God. Go back to 1 Corinthians 12, uh, 2. No one can say Jesus is accursed. Um, and be of the Holy Spirit. It is the utterance of the Antichrist. Now, I've dealt with that concept extensively in chapter 2, verses 18 through 25. So I'm going to just say, go back and listen to that tape or see that video again. Uh, you have heard that it is coming and right now is already in the world. John uses the singular and the plural. There is coming an incarnation of evil, and that is the Antichrist, the, la the man of lawlessness in the last days. But there is a spirit of the Antichrist in every age. 
And that spirit does one of two things. Either denies something about Jesus, which is the case in 1 John, or it tries to usurp the place of Christ, which is Matthew 24. Okay? Now in verse 4. Notice in verse 4 there is a you. In verse 5 there is a they. And in verse 6 there is a we. Obviously there's two groups here. John and the believers and the false teachers. And that's the dichotomy here. You are the children of God, dear children, and you have conquered perfect tense, these men, because he who is in our heart is greater than he who is in the world. Now here we have the concept of the indwelling uh, deity. And in verse 4, the emphasis is on the indwelling Father. Greater is He, God, that is in you. This same emphasis is made over in verse 15, the indwelling Father. In Colossians 1.22, we have an emphasis on the indwelling Son, Christ in you, the hope of glory. But usually in the New Testament, it is the indwelling Holy Spirit who is the active part of the Trini Trinity in our world today. Now, Jesus said, Lo, I'm with you always. So there's a real fluidity between the persons of the Trinity. All can be said to indwell us. All can be said to be with us. And so we can't be too dogmatic and compartmentalize uh, the persons of the Trinity. Now, when it says, He who's in the world, this is an obvious reference to Satan. John 12, 31. And that, of course, is the prince and the power of the air, the God of this world. Now, friends, I don't know about you. I watch these scary movies sometimes, and I get so frightened. And when I get frightened, I always have to get up in the middle of the night. And boy, I quote this verse all the way. Greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. And that's a significant verse, I think, for give us assurance of the power of the Trinitarian God in us. Now, in verse 5, they are the children of the world. This is why they speak what the world inspires and why the world listens to them. Now, one way you can tell who's of God and who's of the evil one is by the audience. Friends, success is not automatically, automatically from God. John 15, 29, excuse me, 15, 19. And you might want to see 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 1. He's talking about how that in the last days will come false teachers and they're going to say what people like to hear and have a large following but not speak for God. Now then it says, and why, this is why the world listens to them. Verse 6, we are the children of God. Whoever knows God by experience listens to us. You all see John 8, 47 and John 18, 37. Jesus said, My sheep know my voice, and they follow me. Now, friends, when we, when we speak, claiming to be from God, God's people will respond. They'll recognize that voice. Now, let's see. Moving on to verse 7. Now, verse 7 through 21 is really an amplification of this major theme of 1 John, which is love one another. It's been dealt with in chapter 2, verses 7 through 12, chapter 3, verses 11 through 24, and now here it is again in chapter 4, verses 7 through 21. This is why it's so difficult to outline the book of 1 John. It's more of a musical score with a repeating motif or melody. And we see these themes coming back again and again, a little different, a little added, uh, all the way th through the, the whole book. Now, dearly beloved, let us practice loving one another. Present tense. The one characteristic of all believers. Let me say it again. The one indispensable characteristic of all believers is God's kind of love in our life. You ought to read 1 Corinthians 13 and Galatians 5.22. The fruit, singular, of the Spirit is love. And then gentleness, patience, kindness, long-suffering, those are just definitions of what God's kind of love is like uh, in human beings in our day. Because love originates from God. God is not emotionally oriented. God is purposefully oriented. He didn't love you so much He wrung His hands and cried. He loved you so much He sent His only begotten Son into the world. Now, and everyone who practices loving is a child of God and knows God by experience. Whoever does not love, present tense. And here's this emphasis on habitual action. Whoever does not habitually love has never come to know God. Aorist tense. Has never known God by experience because God is love. Now, love is not God, but everything God does, judgment included, He does in love. This is why the love of God for us has been shown. Aorist passive. Once and for all by an outside agent shown, namely... Uh, that God has sent His only Son into the world that we might, uh, that we, through Him, might have life. This has sent, perfect tense, sent and He remains. 
Now, the word only is the Greek word monogenes. It's only used by John five times. John's Gospel, chapter 1, verses 14 and 18. John, chapter 3, Nicodemus, 16 and 18. And here in 1 John. The emphasis of monogenes is only unique, one of a kind. Now, we are children of God through our relationship with Christ. There's only one Son like Christ, full deity. Now, Sin his son to the world that we might live through him. You might want to see 2 Corinthians 9.15 and Romans 8.32 about what God sending his son. In this way is seen the true love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sin. God always takes initiative. You don't choose the day you're going to come to Christ. Only when God's Spirit leads you. John 6, 44 and 65 says, No one comes unto the Father unless the Holy Spirit draws them or woos them. And so we must come when we feel that still small voice of God speaking to us. God takes initiative. Then the word atoning sacrifice is a curse the word, pardon me, the word propitiation. I dealt with that completely in chapter 2, verse 2. So if you'll go back, you can see the full impact of this word. Now, basically what this word is, it's used in the book of Hebrews for the mercy seat, okay? And what we have there is the place where the blood was placed on the Day of Atonement, Leviticus 16, that covered the sins of Israel for a year. Chapter 2, verse 2. Now let's go to, chapter, to verse 11. Dearly beloved, if God has loved us so, and here we have first-class conditional sentence assumed to be true, since God has loved us so. So, not so much, but just like John 3.16, in such a manner. Now, we ought is a very important aspect of 1 John. John 2.6, John 3.16 also have this word, we must love one another. Love is not an option. Look at verse 21. For the Christian, love is a mandate. You can't say Jesus is Lord and not love those for whom he's died. Now, it continues in... Uh, all right, verse 12. No one has ever seen God. And this word seen means to gaze intently at, to look and examine carefully. No one has examined carefully the essence of God. Because God is spirit, he can't be seen. Now, you might want to go back to John 1, 18. And the passage that confuses many people is Exodus 33:20, 20, where it says, Moses saw God's hind parts in King James. God doesn't have any hind parts. God is spirit. What that Hebrew word means is afterglow. Moses saw God's afterglow. No one has seen God because God is spirit. Yet, if, third class conditional, we practice loving one another, God remains in union with us, and our love for him attains perfection in our hearts. Perfect passive. Now, friends, this will amaze you. When we see Jesus Christ, we see God completely. In Hebrews 1, 2, and 3, to see Jesus loving uh, the children, loving the sinners, embracing the leper, healing the blind, calming the storm, we see God in action. But I've got something more amazing than that for you. When we see Christians loving one another with God's kind of love, we also see God. Oh, me. What, what, what a statement. Now, verse 13. By the fact that he has given, perfect tense, us a portion of his spirit. Now we're going back to what we picked up on chapter 3, verse 24. You might want to see Romans 8, 16. Now I believe verses 13 and 14 are related in this way. We have an intuitive, internal, subjective witness of our salvation. We have an inner assurance that is the Holy Spirit's witnessing with our spirits, Romans 8, 16. And then we have an outward, objective witness. That's in verse 14, and that's the apostolic truth contained in the Bible. We know we're saved because of the promises of the Word of God and the internal witness of the Holy Spirit. We have two witnesses, not one, and here they are. Verse 13, subjective. Verse 14, objective. Now, John in verse 14 says, We have seen and now testify. The word seen is exactly the word back up in verse 12. We have gazed intently at. We have looked at Jesus from every angle. We've examined him closely. Now, the word here is perfect middle. I myself in the past have looked at him and the results of my examination remain. And now testify, present tense. I've looked, it remains, and now I continue to habitually testify that the Father has sent, perfect tense, his Son to be the Savior of the world. You ought to see John 4, 42. 
Okay, verse 15. Whoever owns that Jesus is the Son of God, this word owns is the word confess, and it is an aorist subjunctive. Whoever will once and for all publicly, specifically testify of their personal trust in me is of God. God remains in union with him and he in union with God. This emphasis on abiding or remaining or uh, uh, attachment is, of course, much like John 15, about 1 through 11. All right? Um, let me go down to verse 16. So we know, perfect tense, by experience and trust, perfect tense, the love that God has for us. Now, it's hard to know in 1 John whether these are subjective genitives or objective genitives. Our love for God or God's love for us. The word trust here can be the same. You can translate it believe, trust, or faith. There's only one Greek root here, and the, the idea of the Greek root is not so much knowledge, though you have to have some knowledge, and not so much emotions, though we are emotional creatures, but it's basically a volitional commitment to. So any place in the New Testament, you see the word believe, trust, or faith, they can be used interchangeably. I've done a tape on that called uh, uh, Faith, What Is It? where I have really gone back and tried to redefine what faith is from a biblical perspective, not from our cultural denominational perspective. If you'll write me, I'll send you our free catalog where that tape, What Is Faith, is there. Now, a form of the word paragraph, if we could, which says, God is love, and whoever continues to love continues in union with God, and God in union with him. Now, that shows that love is the sign that we are of God. And now verse 17. The sign that we are of God. And now verse 17. Notice it says, our love attains perfection. Now, the word perfection, the root here is telos. Telos does not mean the absence of any problems or our English concept of perfection. It means maturity, completeness. What this is saying is, when we meet Jesus Christ, his love is going to start being worked out in our daily lives. That's the idea here. Um, through having perfect confidence. Now, you might have the word boldness. This is a word used so often in 1 John, and its basic meaning is freedom of speech. 2.28, 3.16, 5.14, and here in chapter 4. This is the idea that when, when we come to God in prayer, we come boldly before the throne of grace. It's the idea that whenever we stop and, and, and think about God, that we have no fear. We come confidently before Him. As a child comes before his father, because of who we are in Jesus Christ. Boy, hallelujah. No fear. And that's what he's talking about. About the day of judgment. If Jesus were to come back, would you be ashamed to see him? Afraid to see him? Or would you be thrilled to death he's come to get you? Then it continues about fear. Um, because here in this world, we are living as he did. There is no fear in love. And perfect love drives out fear because fear pertains to punishment and no one who is subject to fear has obtained perfection in love. I think base, this is talking about the second coming, that those who have tried to live for Christ are longing to see him, but that Christians who are not living for him are going to be ashamed and afraid even at the coming of their Lord. Now, it continues in verse 18. There is no fear in love. Perfect love casts out fear. And then verse 19, we love because he first loved us. God always takes the initiative. And the best we can do in love is emulate what God has done for us. We reflect the love of God. We do not generate or originate love. We only can reflect what God has already done for us in Christ. That's why we laid in our lives for others. Now, verse 20 is very important. In verse 20, this is a little phrase, if anyone says, that we have seen so often in 1 John, especially in chapters 1 and 2. Now, what 1 John is doing here is saying, this is what the false teachers are saying. Remember back in chapter 1, verses 6, verse 8, verse 10, chapter 2, verse 4, verse 6, uh, excuse me, chapter 2, verse yeah, 4 and 6 and 9. These are the places where it says, if anyone says. And here's what the false teachers are saying. I love God. They were claiming that they knew God. They loved God. But look what they said. And habitually hates his brother. Present tense. Keeps on hating. He is a liar. If, if those of you who like a, have to do a devotional sometime, if you'll look at the book of 1 John, John calls six different men liars. It's an awful good thought there. Here's the, the man who says he loves God but hates his brother. Now, the word liar here means he's either habitually hating or he is... Uh, 
denying he's a sinner or he's rejecting the person of Christ. Now, that's the kind of liars we've had. Okay? For whoever does not love his brother whom he, he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. Have you ever heard someone say, I really love mankind. It's just people I hate. Well, that's the ideal here. Here we have all these folks saying, oh, I love God. I just love God. They've never seen God. But they have seen their brother. They've seen him in need. They've seen him in want. When they love their brother, they're showing that they truly love God. You cannot love God. If the vertical relationship is in place, the horizontal will be in place. You cannot have the horizontal without the vertical. Now, look at verse 21. This is the command that we get from him, that whoever loves God loves his brother too. Friends, love is not an option. It's a command. We don't have a choice. Love one another. Now, we've defined love. We've shown the criteria. And that's what the fourth chapter is all about. Well, I hope you'll send for those tapes I mentioned to you. I, two of them. One of them is, How Do You Know Who Speaks the Truth? Which is a sermon based on chapter 4, verses 1 through 6. And the other one is, What is Faith? Because I think we are very guilty of defining biblical words as our culture uses them, as our denomination uses them, and that's called eisegesis. What we want to do is find out what the biblical authors meant by those terms and what the people of their day understood them to mean, and then we try to bring that out of the text. That's called exegesis, and these tapes will be helpful to you. We'll send you a free catalog of over 1,600 teaching tapes. I've enjoyed being with you, and we'll see you again, same time, same place, next week. God bless you.